So I was saying today, I'm gonna talk about machine learning potentials. In particular, I'll show an application for molecular compounds. Um, now, this is the last day of a machine learning workshop, so you, everybody here knows already what machine learning is and what force we are. Um, so I prepared an introduction, a very short one, on what context I was working on when I got into this field. So essentially, I'm a chemist. I was working in coordination chemistry in particular, and here in molecular magnetism, to be exact. And, but coordination chemistry, it's a very wild field and uh, finds applications also in catalysis, methyloproteins, and methyl organic frameworks, just to name a few examples. Uh, just to show you what a molecular complex looks like, I borrow an example from the molecular magnetism community. This is a very small molecule if, you, if you're looking at, at applications, and nonetheless already contains a few different elements. You have different kind of bonds, so you have here, for instance, the usual organic chemistry bonds like carbon-carbon interactions, which are usually very well described also by other more simpler kind of force fields. Uh, but at the same time, you also have coordination bonds. So this is the interaction between the transition metal ions and the ligands. And this kind of interaction, usually, it's not very uh, exportable in a sense of force field. So it really depends on a larger environment, not just in the first neighbor distance. So it's usually very tricky to be described with force fields. And so let's suppose you want to run molecular dynamics for this class of compounds. And even if you refer to a very recent review on the topic, uh, you get pointed towards uh, classical forces that were used for organic chemistry, essentially. Well, at, at least this is the perspective of a chemist. So you, even if you try to use this kind of force field to apply for this kind of applications here, they don't really work well. They, are, they have a lot of uh, limitations. And so that, that's the reason why I decided to give a try to machine learning, because I thought it was a, a possible solution to this problem. So we would like to have a model which can be generally applied to any uh, chemical compound. So the outline of our procedure is this one. Uh, we start, clearly, you choose the force field that you want to try. Then you generate a training set, which in our case is done by DFT calculations. Then you go to the training stage. Essentially, you teach the force field to reproduce the potential energy surface of your system and then you compare your prediction with the uh, reference states, which are, again, DFT calculations. And finally, if everything is OK, you go to predictions. Uh, this is the model we implemented. It's called Snap Force Field. It's a very uh, simple implementation of machine learning, I think. And it's based on a descriptor, which is the bispectrum components that were uh, designed for the first time, I think, in this paper here from 2010. So how does it work? Essentially, you start from the Cartesian uh, coordinates of your system. You choose a cutoff radius, so you get all the atoms within this cutoff radius to describe the atomic environment of a given element. You plug these Cartesian coordinates into this relation here, and you get a representation of the environment. Now, you need to uh, make this representation a uh, rotational invariant, and you can accomplish that by doing this, uh, applying this expression here, which is essentially it's an average on the possible orientation of your environment in space. And what you get at the end is this descriptor, the bispectrum components, which has the correct um, symmetry features. Uh, now we need a, a force field, so an expression for the energy to predict the energy of our system. And the one we chose, it comes from this paper here, and it's uh, probably the easiest thing you can do in machine learning, so you assume that your relation of the energy is linear in the bispectrum components, uh, where these beta here are coefficients that you want to determine. So these are the parameters of the force field. Now, having a linear expression between the energy and the descriptor makes the training stage extremely easy. So this is very uh, immediate. You can simply ap apply ridge regression to train the model, and in one matrix inversion, you get all the parameters of the force field. So essentially, we do a linear uh, square uh, regression plus a regularization term that helps to avoid overfitting of our data. So let me show you some uh, results uh, for a toy model in this case. So this is an iron plus three uh, transition methyl. Uh, it's coordinated by six chlorides. We generated 800 distorted distortions for this molecule and we 
compute the, the energy of all of them with the FT. We then split the total uh, available configurations in three sets. The training set, which is the one used to actually do the training of the model. Then we have the validation set, which is used to set the hyperparameter of ridge regression. And finally, we use the test set to validate the model. You see here uh, the learning curve. You have the kilocal per mole, the error for the three sets as function of the number of configurations that we use to train the model. As you see at first, when you have only 100 configurations, the, there is a large difference between how the model uh, predicts the energy for the training set and the, the results on the test sets. However, these two values converge after a few hundred configuration, including the test set, and you're sure at this point that you have a good predictability and a good generalizability. <coughs> In particular, I think it's worth to be noticed that the number of configurations we need to reach a good level of accuracy is really small, so we are just a few hundreds, and the energy value you get is really small, it's 10 to the minus 2 kilocal per mole. We also tested this model on other toy systems, just to be sure that the, it was possible to describe all the most important environments encountered in transition metal chemistry. We also threw in two very simple organic molecules just to complete the picture, and we used the same exact um, prescription as before, and as you see here, the error is always small. For this case, it's always below one kilocal per mole. It's also nice, I think, especially for chemists, uh, to see that uh, this force field here can also reproduce some very fine features of the potential energy surface, like the Jan Teller distortion. Just to introduce the thing, uh, if you have, uh, well, the Jan Teller theorem states that there cannot be an electronic degenerate ground state. So if you consider the perfect octahedral uh, geometry, this can also just be stable for, uh, for instance, for five electrons, which is the case of iron. And indeed, the force field reproduces uh, this potential energy surface. And this structure here is perfectly stable. It's the ground state correctly. However, if you go to manganese, then you have four electrons, which means that the perfect octahedral structure would be unstable upon Jan Teller distortion. And indeed, the force field predicted very well. All right, so le let's see something slightly more complicated. We tested this on ferrocene. This is uh, an iron plus two. Uh, ion coordinated by these two uh, uh, carbon disks here. And we use the same prescription as before. And as you see, also in this case, the error is it's quite small. However, as soon as you try to, do, to run a molecular dynamics calculation with this force field, the structure undergoes some terrible deformation that you clearly don't want to see during molecular dynamics run. And the reason is simply because it's really hard to train to generate a training set that contains all the relevant structures from, from scratch. A very useful way to avoid this kind of prediction, weird prediction, is to do active learning. we have seen already a few cases of this. Essentially what you do, you first generate the first uh, training set, you train your model, you start doing molecular dynamics, but you also monitor the structures during molecular dynamics. Once in a while you compare your structure with the reference training set, and if the structure you're observing is too far away from where you started your, uh, on generating the model, you stop the calculation, you do a new DFT calculation, and you update your model. And for instance, if you apply this to ferrocene, and after sampling 100 new configurations at high temperature, the dynamics becomes perfectly stable, you can run extended period of time of calculations. And here, just to show an example of the smoothness of the FES, we are looking at the energy when you are rotating the two disks of ferrocene one with respect to the other. And here we are able to reproduce this barrier, which is already very small in energy, so it's not, it's not a trivial, trivial exercise. We also uh, apply the same procedure to an organic molecule, just to be sure that it was not just working for transition metal complexes. Uh, we chose alanine, it's a very simple amino acid. Uh, same prescription as before, we can get very small uh, errors on both test and training set. Here, however, just a quick remark, this molecule is more flexible than the one we've seen before, and indeed, at the refinement stage, we needed more structures to be sampled from MD. But nonetheless, after a few hundred new configurations sampled with active learning, 
the dynamics become stable and you don't need to use DFT anymore. We also compared the results and the accuracy of our SNAP implementation with GAF, which is a part of the Amber family of force fields, which are probably the most used force fields among chemists, I would say, especially those involved in uh, biochemistry applications. Um, so we sample configurations from MD between 200 and 400 Kelvin. And here you see the, the DFT energy against the force field one, in green our predictions, and in purple the amber prediction. Both the force field, I think they work quite well at low temperature or at least for uh, small distortions. And this is expected, especially because the amber force field is harmonic. So as long as the distortion is not huge with respect to the equilibrium structure, you would expect it to work well. But however, the amber force field start deviating significantly for uh, larger distortion. And while our force field maintain, let's say, more or less the same kind of error across the entire energy spectrum and it's able, let's say, to capture all the anharmonic effects during molecular dynamics. We'd like to show you one final example. And we also uh, tested our model on something more complicated. So here we were interested in studying the iron plus two porphyrin complex. This is essentially the moiety inside the protein in our body that carries oxygen around. And here we also uh, prepare the force field, not just for the molecule when it's bonded to the oxygen, but also when it's not. And also the configurations in between to see if we were able to uh, reproduce the reactivity of this model here. And you see here the errors on the training and test set are, again, very small. We use a slightly larger number of configurations in this case, and this is because we are trying to sample a larger phase space with respect to, to before. So here we have also the reaction and two different uh, configurations for this molecule. Here in blue, you see the energy against the iron-oxygen distance. So this is the essentially the reaction pathway. As you see, the dots are the DFT calculations, while the the model, it's the continuous line, and it's very well reproduced. And in this case, we also try to describe another properties, another property beside energy, which is a local one, and it's the iron spin density. It was interesting in this case because iron here, it's an open shell system, and during the reaction, we also observe um, an, ele an electron transfer from the oxygen, and the spin density of the the iron goes from one to two, and it's uh, very well reproduced by the model as well. So to conclude, I think there are three main take home messages from this presentation. The first one is that it's a very, let's say, simple model, probably much simpler than deep learning, but nonetheless, it can be used to describe at good accuracy organic chemistry and transition methyl chemistry. So it's a general model for a molecular system, and it's very easy to be trained. Just a few hundreds configurations, usually it's already all right to, to have production runs in molecular dynamics. And this is true, especially if you use a self-consistent refinement of your training set during molecular dynamics. So we are still working on this model. We are, at the moment, also looking at ways to define a more robust starting training set. This is to reduce the number of configurations that we need to sample later on during molecular dynamics. Uh, we are also looking at the way to describe multiple local environments at the same time. So here I've been showing results for a single molecule. So every time we, we're changing molecule, we are reparameterizing the force field. But of course, it would be nice to have a general param parameterization for every element and then some level of exportability of the parameters. And finally, something that I think it's really uh, interesting, it's uh, the possibility to explain to extend this framework to describe also tensorial properties. So not just describe the energy, but also describe uh, electronic properties, magnetic properties, and we are also working on that. So let me just thank the Sambitos group in Dublin, and thank you for your attention. The question. Thanks for your presentation. A quick question. So you try to fit a system-specific potential. Yes. So any way 
to do a transferable potential for um, an organic system? Well, that's something we are testing. I mean, so far, the only thing I've tried is to reproduce the formation energy of a data set, the GD5, uh, I think. Uh, and it works really well for just the formation energy at least. So also in that case, we have two milliv per atom of error. Next step would be to include both the formation energy and also the, the energy of distortion. So that's something I want to try, absolutely. Any other? Well, what's happening with the number of parameters if you put in more, more elements? It scales linearly with the number of species. So here we are using a, an order of the bispectrum component, which is eight, which means that we have 56 parameter per chemical species. So, I mean, the number of parameters is really small, so usually you can train very complex system and you don't have a huge problem. You, don't, you never need to, to go to really huge uh, sizes of training set. So the number of parameters is quite uh, gets linearly with the size of the system. Okay. Well, any other questions? If not, thank you again.